And thank you all for being with us. This is a joint partnership between the Virginia CDFI Coalition and the microfinance team here at Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. To participate, we do ask that everyone stays muted as much as possible and use the in-meeting chat to ask questions. That will be at the lower right-hand corner of your screen. There's a little icon that looks like a chat bubble, and that's how you can introduce yourself to the group, ask questions of the speakers, and participate in that part of the conversation. You may also want to turn your camera off just to eliminate some of the visual clutter for the presentation today. And we are going to go ahead and get started. A very big thank you to our speakers today, not only for being a part of our presentation for everyone this morning, but also um, some of you may have had to register for this webinar multiple times because we had some IT hiccups when we tried to do this the first time. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to everyone who's joining us today for your patience, your persistence, and your flexibility. So this morning, we are welcoming Dave Prosser with uh, Freedom First Federal Credit Union. Carlene Sinclair Robinson with the Community Business Partnership. Yes, feel free to wave and say hello to everyone. Um, Gufrain Ahmad with Community Business Partnership as well. And Alexandra Semiego. I'm sorry, I should have practiced all of these names beforehand. Samaniego with the Latino Economic Development Center. And I am really pleased to say that all of these organizations are partners of DHCD as well as grantees through our Virginia CDFI Fund, which does business as the Virginia Small Business Resiliency Fund. And now I am going to, oh, we're gonna say just a little bit uh, about the Virginia CDFI Coalition that is a collective voice for addressing issues concerning unmet financial needs of the Virginia communities by advocating for awareness of CDFI activities and operations. So if you're not familiar with CDFIs or you want to know more about how they do business, what the CDFIs in Virginia are that serve your area, we definitely encourage you to Thank you, Carlene, to take a look at the Virginia CDFI Coalition website and get to know the CDFI ecosystem here in Virginia. And without further ado, I am going to hand it to Dave Prosser to uh, tell us more about Freedom First and some of the activities that they're involved in here in Virginia. Thank you, Rebecca. So um, some of you may be familiar with Freedom First, uh, but we are the credit union uh, amongst the uh, CDFI group that's here. And we had actually received our uh, CDFI designation in uh, 20, uh, 2000. Um, so it's been uh, a number of years ago that we received that designation and um, pretty excited about what we've been able to do with it. And um, you know, we are located in um, Southwest Virginia uh, in the Roanoke region. Um, historically, uh, Freedom First Credit Union served a three county territory, but in 2021, we were able to take advantage of a rural uh, charter expansion, which allowed us to expand our footprint into uh, 20 uh, counties uh, along the Appalachian region. And, and of course, most of that area, um, you know, with that rural community charter has a lot of the challenges um, that you can imagine uh, with serving that marketplace. And we um, today are about uh, a million, uh, a billion dollars in assets. Uh, and I will say that our portfolio consists of about one third of uh, real estate, a third in the commercial lending space, and the other third is really in the commercial space. But when I refer to the commercial, we historically had done a lot of large business deals, um, you know, quite a few uh, million dollars worth of deals. Um, and what that has meant to our CDFI designation is it, it has put us at risk of, of uh, losing that accreditation because uh, some of those larger deals um, are, are kind of um, knocking us out of that 60% um, 
you know, marketplace where we have to maintain our designation by serving low income households. So we really had to keep our eye on the ball um, so that we are not lending uh, to individuals or communities that put us over that, that benchmark. And so one of the components we really were missing was the small business um, or the micro business um, uh, component of that. And so this, this program, the Resiliency Fund, really allowed us to kind of move things forward um, so that we could help us in maintaining that designation. And really, um, as you can see uh, from our trade line now uh, up at the top of that screen there where people bank for good, that we really were doing the right thing in our community um, by serving um, you know, individuals of modest mean, and um, supporting, of course, businesses also that kind of fell into that, that category or bucket. So I'll go ahead and if we can advance to the next uh, screen, talk a little about some of the core um, areas that we focus in on, which are, you know, looking at, you know, what are, uh, what can we do in our community and that we are in fact community oriented. Um, we, you know, consider ourselves to be economic drivers, um, whether that is that we are supporting uh, commercial loans that are doing economic revitalization um, in our community using historic tax credits, new market tax credits, um, or you know, just working on those community facility type deals that are um, those businesses themselves are supporting low income, or um, you know the underserved marketplace that we are in fact um, uh, making a conscious effort to do that. You know, we also pride ourselves on being the local experts in our community um, by having our borrowers and our uh, underwriting local. Um, we are able to really kind of dig into um, a deal and find out how it's unique and how it's going to support our community. Um, and it's, it's not um, a deal that we have to send to a central office in another state to be approved. You know, we can um, act very quickly. And so that's one of the, the core advantages for us is, in fact, um, you know, uh, being local um, and take advantage of um, what that means in our marketplace and, and convincing people that by banking local, um, you can support, you know, local uh, businesses and support the uh, the local environment. And of course, you know, we are member owned, um, so we are a cooperative. Um, so every investment that we do make in a loan or a deal, we have to make sure that we're working um, with the best interest uh, in mind of our members, because um, unlike a shareholder, um, we're not uh, maximizing profits to benefit shareholders, but we need to be able to provide a return to our members um, who are our all collectively um, owners of, of our credit union. And so we can um, you know, also pride ourselves in the fact that we're going to be offering uh, the best rates, um, whether that's um, deposits or you know loan rates or we can be flexible in the type of deals that we um, you know certainly uh, put together so we do kind of focus in on uh, three core areas and that is um, help everyone improve their financial well-being uh, help communities be vibrant um, and equitable and inclusive and then thirdly, helping small businesses and nonprofits achieve their goals. So, of course, the Resiliency Fund would fit um, nicely within that, that particular category. So we advance to the, the next um, stage, the next page there. Um, so, you know, we, we have a mission to smart, support small businesses. Um, you know, what is that value of being local and being able to dig into um, different uh, deals that are out there? Um, and we talked about that that CDFI designation and why it's important for us to maintain that designation um, and diversify our, our uh, commercial portfolio so that we are lending uh, to the right um, populations of individuals to maintain that designation. And we have to keep our eye on that because it is, a, it is a big deal for us with that market expansion that we have done. As we know, a lot of the, the CDFI designations, it has to be a, an approved targeted market. And with our charter expansion, we have a lot of uh, deals going on, say in our Lynchburg marketplace or Danville or Martinsville area, but that's not technically today in our approved targeted market, it, but it is um, certainly uh, 
populations that um, you know um, could be use of assistance and, and would be a win for us, but we have to um, make sure that they're included in our targeted market expansion, uh, in which we do have an, uh, an outstanding application today for. So talking specifically about the resiliency fund, and if we can move to the next uh, slide, um, how we utilized um, the funding that we did receive from the Small Business Resiliency. And we, we were able to access uh, one and a half million dollars to really uh, focus in on developing small business um, uh, in our community by offering micro grants and small uh, dollar loans. And what we considered um, a small dollar loan was anything under $300,000 and a micro loan, anything 50,000 or less. Um, I know since we received the funding um, in February, we've been able to deploy about $11.5 million um, that kind of fit uh, that category. But how we uh, utilize the resiliency fund is of course, we were able to provide technical assistance and financial education to some of our consumers. Here in the Roanoke area, uh, Freedom First Credit Union in partnership with Roanoke City open up a financial empowerment center in um, which we can provide financial education and financial coaching uh, to our population um, at large. And a lot of times when working with um, different partners that are um, assisting uh, individuals with small business development, oftentimes we find that we have to back up um, uh, and ask to help a person individually support themselves. Um, so a lot of times we are addressing other personal issues uh, before they can get their house in order to be eligible to do a commercial uh, loan. Um, and whether it's with us or in, uh, any other uh, bank or credit union that may be out there, we are, are um, finding ourselves um, um, starting at the basics um, and helping educate people. And so through our Financial Empowerment Center, we are able to do that basic financial education to get them individually prepared, but also we can help them in doing some other small business advocacy, such as um, uh, 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 business development, business planning, um, putting together a business plan itself and understanding just what the process does entail and, and, and what that is going to look like. So um, we provide a lot of mentorships with um, some of our small other business development centers that are out there. And in a partnership with that, we also were able to access some funding. Uh, I think we asked for about $50,000 uh, for capacity building uh, to support three core areas within our marketplace, which was our Roanoke Small Business Development Center, which is um, really funded under our uh, local chamber of commerce. We have the Advancement Foundation. Some of you be, may be familiar with the work that they do, but they've got a lot of Go Virginia funding um, to help support uh, the small business development. Um, and then, um, of course, the, uh, the, the RAMP program, which, the, which is the, the Regional Accelerator and Mentoring Program. And they're really focused in on um, uh, the uh, STEM type startup businesses. Um, they are predominantly supporting our Innovation Corridor, which is a partnership with our largest healthcare system, Carillion, and also partnership with Virginia Tech is are trying to um, do startup businesses um, that are tackling STEM uh, focus areas. And so we were able to um, uh, give some uh, money uh, to each one of those organizations to support the efforts that they are working on uh, within their community. And of course, with a lot of those partners, we also um, are providing our own expertise in-house to be mentors in each of those programs. So we have some staff that are providing technical support uh, for th those three organizations, which then bleed out into uh, the individual businesses to help them uh, the, with the wealth building and getting to the point where they can uh, become borrowers and, and um, advance their initiatives. We also were able to do a little bit of a carve out to do an IDA match. Um, so we created a five to one um, IDA program for startup businesses up to $2,500 uh, for each uh, eligible uh, client. 
Um, so if they um, you know, deposit a dollar into a savings account that they have on deposit with us, we will match it up to uh, five, uh, a match of five, um, five dollars with that dollar match. Um, and so we were able to also use the resiliency fund uh, to launch that program. Um, so that's been well received. And even with a gauntlet program, they also have an IDA uh, match through the Go of Virginia. And so we've been able to use this in partnership with that to kind of leverage additional funding sources so some small businesses can get um, up and going. And then of course, the last thing is um, that we received some resiliency funding for was that we were able to create a loan loss reserve uh, to help us take a little bit more risk on our books uh, when lending to some of these small businesses. And of course, the resiliency fund was really created to help uh, support um, you know, minority populations, individuals of color, uh, women, um, um, you know, our, our immigration uh, population as well. Um, so those that you know, may not have that upper hand um, and of course, there wasn't a little bit of a marginal um, ask in there also to support our administrative costs. So collectively, this program was able to launch us into the small business space that we had not historically been in. And so, um, you know, to date, like I mentioned, we've done about 11 million, 11 and, uh, and a half million dollars in that space. So we're quite um, excited about what that's going to do uh, for us. Um, so I think we'll advance to the next slide and we'll turn it over to our, our next speaker. Good morning, everyone. Once again, Carlene Sinclair Robinson with a Community Business Partnership. Um, we are a partner source with uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development, of course, but also with the Small Business Administration and the U.S. Treasury as a certified uh, entity. Uh, could we advance to the next slide, please? So to keep it, you know, within the spectrum of what we've been able to do over the years, so Community Business Partnership started in 1995 because of access to capital challenges within a certain geographical area here in Northern Virginia, specifically in the Fairfax County region, to support uh, women and uh, minorities getting access to capital. With that, we've advanced to the point where we are now certified, not as long as um, people, uh, Freedom First, but definitely been at it for a number of years with the certification. It has been an interesting time for what we've been able to do also with advancing our programs. We also are a partner resource with uh, uh, an actual a uh, source sponsored program through George Mason University. And that basically means that we're connected to the Mason Enterprise Center ecosystem, where we have a small business development center, a women's business development center, and other programs to help support small businesses in our region. Now we're not only supporting Fairfax County, we are a, we have the footprint for the Washington DC metro area for our CDFI certification and with thanks to uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development for Virginia, where we've expanded into some other areas. Uh, so I always tell our clients when they come to some of our training sessions that FYI, uh, financing is really about geography. So we need to understand where a, a business owner is located that then determines whether they're eligible, not solely Disqual completely disqualified from accessing capital, but might not be able to get it through an entity like ours. So from there, being an SBA partner source, that means that we're again thinking geogra geographically where the SBA has approved us for funding a, a business owner in a specific area. So this is a there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to get a loan program going to be able to offer it within a specific region. From that, you know, as the clients you're serving or if you are a potential applicant, be mindful of the fact that not all lenders can lend in your specific area. We have been um, at we've been at it to make sure that we are able to offer what type of funding that's necessary for small businesses, the challenges that they're experiencing. So like uh, Freedom First, we were also able to access the resiliency program through the 
CDFI fund and now I've been able to get access to the Small Business Resiliency Program here in Virginia. And with that, I will turn it over to our director for the Business Finance Center here, Community Business Partnership. Well, thank you, Caroline. Um, and good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to speak about the Small Dollar Loan Program. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, um, so the purpose of the STL program. Um, so this program is a, a CD, a, a, a program from US Treasury, uh, from CDF fund. Um, and in, under this program, the ultimate goal is to help the underserved or LMI community, LMI means low to moderate income community, to make sure we give them uh, proper guidance, provide them with seed money that they need uh, to start a new business. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about the small dollar loan program, um, and when we talk about the reducing the wealth gap within the LMI community, there are so many different factors that are uh, part of that. But one of uh, the root causes of uh, that wealth gap is payday lending. A lot of uh, LMI, low to moderate income uh, folks, especially new immigrants, when they come to the, the, the US, they do not have any credit, but they have low credit. Um, so in order to start a new business, what they do is they will go to these PD lenders and they get so excited because they're getting some capital. But uh, um, if their business they do they do not uh, that doesn't go well, then what happens is they end up in a lot of debt um, and they cannot repay the loan. So what happens then is it affects their credit in a negative way, which basically will put them more in debt and they cannot um, become bankable. So. In order to offset that, um, CBP is offering this SDL program to help those uh, immigrant population or LMI community so that they can receive though that seed money from CBP so that we can guide them in the right direction. This money will help them in building their own credit because we report this to credit agency as well. So as a result of that, uh, um, they, we can make them bankable so that they can reach out to credit unions and uh, local traditional banks to get more funding like auto loan, or it can help in, in increasing the loan ownership as well. Next slide, please. So under this program, again, this is focused on consumers, but our ultimate focus is to help those consumers get the seed money to start a new business. So uh, who is eligible to get this uh, loan? So every consumer can apply for this type of funding. It has to be that the threshold is $2,500. Uh, it has to be a loan, not a line of credit. There is no prepayment penalty involved. And we report this to uh, credit bureau agencies. So think about this, compare this with pay the lenders, right? So there is a huge difference. So the, the new immigrant, the LMI folks or folks, consumers who have already received funding from these payday lenders, it will help them a lot. And um, uh, we at CBP not only offer this small dollar loan program, but we also offer um, the other programs as well. Um, so when we, the first step is help them provide them with seed money, help them uh, with this, uh, provide them with some technical assistance, help them est uh, establish their own uh, credit make them bankable so that they can uh, receive more funding from us or other banks. Next slide, please. So what is our ideal client? Again, ideal client is a um, new immigrant or um, LMI folks, folks who do not have uh, any credit or low credit, uh, any consumer or business owner who needs to improve their financial situation. They need to learn more about personal and business credit or existing business owner if they would like to grow and expand their business. Next slide, please. So Milestone. So uh, we are offering, we're gonna start this program uh, earlier uh, this year in, in a month or so. So we will be offering different cohorts in the first quarter. And ultimate goal is to provide them with different tools and resources to these uh, uh, business owners, these consumers and business owners. We're going to provide them the foundation that they need to start their own business. As we know that many entrepreneurs, they um, fail their business within the first two years, a majority of them. So the strong foundation is needed because this is one of the factors uh, why they fail 
is that they do not have strong foundation. They do not do their due diligence before they start their own business. So with these different cohorts, we will be providing them with all the education that they need, like what resources they do they need, what type of research they need to uh, do. So the output of these cohorts will be a strong business plan. Then we will be offering them one-on-one -on -one counseling because ease business is different. A business model is different. So this is why we'll be working with every business owner one-on-one -on -one, um, to, to, to work on this strategic planning. We will help them in established, uh, establishing a new entity. Um, and if they need any help with operating agreement or any other agreement, partnership agreement, we'll be working with them as well. So once we have those uh, uh, business plan and when we have those sessions, then we will give them a small dollar loan, a loan of $2,500. Now, once they receive that funding, if you are a, a startup or if you're a consumer, then what we will do is we will look at different impact factors. On a quarterly basis, we will look at uh, their business revenue. What is that trend? Is it um, going upwards or downwards? If it is downward, then we will be meeting with those business owners one-on-one -on -one to see what other factors are affecting their revenue. And then we'll be guiding them in the right direction. Job creation, credit check on quarterly basis, which is very important. Because as we know, um, that uh, uh, low to moderate income uh, consumers and business owners, underserved community, they pay about $67,000 more in fees and in interest compared to an average white family. Uh, so this will program will really reduce that wealth gap that is needed in the LMI community. And we'll be sharing success stories uh, with all the funders and uh, um, we will be connecting, we'll be creating, just like uh, Virginia Coalition for CDFIs, we will be creating an informal network as well, um, where clients, similar clients can talk to each other, they can share their own experiences with each other and learn from each other. Um, so by this program, the SDL, uh, it will be uh, helping consumers with uh, uh, high interest rate debt from pay lenders. We will be providing them with business counseling, uh, foundation uh, for strong business plan, providing them receive money. And if there is a business owner who would like to grow their business, we have different programs as well. Um, and we can provide them funding up to $250,000 uh, uh, to grow their business. Next slide. So this is, uh, these are the uh, content information, uh, email address and website. Uh, we are located in Springfield, Virginia. So please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions about the STL program, or if you just wanna talk about your business, or if you wanna talk about different financing options at CBP. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Alexandra Samaniego with the Latino Economic Development Center. Next slide, please. Uh, well, uh, LEDC, we are a nonprofit. Our mission is to drive the economic and social advancement of the law to moderate income Latinos and other um, individuals in the DC. Um, we are actually in the DMV area and also Puerto Rico and help um, them build assets through home ownership and empowership. So as I mentioned before, we have our main headquarters in Washington, D.C. and Columbia Heights. Uh, we also have an office in Wheaton and Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland, in Arlington and Virginia. And also in, we three years ago, it will be three years ago that we opened our new office in Maya West, Puerto Rico. Uh, we have two big programs. We have the small business programs where we do uh, business loans, business advice, credit building, resilient, and we have also some co corridors. And uh, for example, we have the Wheaton corridor along um, in, in the Wheaton Triangle, and also we have the Purple Line, where the Purple Line <laughs> train is going to be uh, built. Uh, we all, and we also have a program called Empower Women International (EWI) that is a program just for women that focuses in women. And we also have the housing program where we do affordable housing preservation, tenant organization, um, first time home buyer education and foreclosure prevention. Next slide, please. 
uh, in this uh, small business, uh, we have, as I mentioned before, we have the small business loans. We are also a CDFI, so we provide uh, very low internet rates during COVID. We also develop some specific products. We have $2,500 interest rate um, to up to 36 months. So we try to make a... Um, the quotes as uh, low as possible. I think the lowest was like forty dollars per month that they had to pay. And we, the goal for this was to. A lot of our clients are they either don't have any credit score or they have very low credit score. So the goal for to develop this product was to help these uh, audience to to get a credit or improve their credit through uh, at least a year. So the small, uh, a small business program by EDLC empowers local entrepreneurs with the tools to realize the full business potential of their ideas. We do this by equipping them with the practical business advice and accessible capital needed in launching a startup venture or expanding our already successful business and operation. So um, for the small business advice, we have kind of two big groups. One that is the idea stage where we help uh, people that have just an idea, entrepreneurs that have an idea, and we and we help them to develop this idea into a business. So we start with the um, validation, the business idea, then a business plan, a strategic plan, marketing plan until they can launch their business. And we also have businesses and operations where we help them. We we do an assessment, and based on that assessment, we give the recommendation and say, based on this assessment, maybe you need to work in this uh, strategic plan. You know, you you need to work in operations, or you need to work in financial tools. So and we provide that and in, in uh, 101 coaching with um one of our coaches in any of the offices so based where the the entrepreneur is located they can um pick one of the coaches in the location that is closest to them uh next slide please As a CDA five, we we have a different type of loans, as you can imagine, as all, all the other partners here uh, presented before. So we have seed loans, startup loans, um, and we have growth loans, uh, and that's kind of just a screenshot of what you can find at our website. Um, as a CD5, LEDC provides alternative micro loan options to startups and existing businesses that have difficulty obtaining credit from the main financial institutions. So, and we try to make as easy as possible for them because, as some of you already mentioned, like our audience is um, a lot of Latinos and immigrants from different parts of the world, and they they have this lack of of the language of lack of technology lack of financial knowledge so it's and and, and from us it's it's, just, it's actually a lot of hand holding from them we have to like hand hold them to the whole process from the beginning to the end um and during covid like uh we had a lot of we helped them with all the grants so it's like actually helping them to collect all the documents put all the documents ready and then we will do the applications for them because they weren't able to do it um uh, by themselves uh so next slide please Uh, this is again some of uh, we we start with five hundred dollars up to two hundred uh, five hundred thousand um, dollars in our lower lowest interest rate it will be six point five. Um, next slide. And so this is a little bit about uh, LEDC in the last year. Uh, I'm sorry, I think it yeah twenty twenty one. Uh, we just ended our fiscal year in September, so it will be 2021, 2022. Uh, so last year, LEDC, we served 3,555 clients and uh, through workshops and 101 um, technic, uh, technical assistance and financing. We serve close to 200 um, entrepreneurs to 106 workshops. Uh, we graduated 70 um, entrepreneurs training for success, food venture initiative, and 
future Baltimore accelerator. So as uh, one of the, I think it was community business partnership, we also have the cohort base uh, for different programs. For the, this past year, we had like one of our biggest one was the food venture initiative where we had, I think it was 85 applicants. And from then we selected 15 applicants that went three months of um, uh, intensive technical assistance with an expert in the food industry. And after that, uh, we have been through all the license permitting. So they, we formalized 15 businesses in Washington, D.C., and then we were able to get a grant from Norwich, D.C. to pay five months of rent in Union Kitchen. So we are trying to close the circle because we provide all the skills, the knowledge to them, but sometimes they are at that point, okay, we have everything, but we don't have it. Uh, um, paying a commercial kitchen is very expensive, it's at least 2000 per month. So they are like, we, we cannot afford to pay that. So with this, we are trying to sit, uh, close the circle everybody since we are paying for this rent. We just started using Union Kitchen October 1st, and we are going to end paying for them in February. We're hoping that with the sales that they are doing during these holidays and everything, they will be able to to start paying by themselves after February. Um, and 1,166 uh, entrepreneurs receive almost 400 of um, TA hours, and we deploy 400 loans and close to 7 um, million in, in loans. And we also, through the Empower Women International, we help 44 women, entrepreneur women. And this year, if you have a time, of course, please help uh, visit our holiday market. It, was be, it will be in the um, Silver Spring Civic Center. We will have, I believe, 58 entrepreneur women selling their, their stuff at the market. And we also help create 47 new businesses. And we help to create and retain 2,000 full-time jobs. Next slide. I think that was it from my side. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of our speakers this morning. Um, so far, we don't have any questions in the chat box, so I can only assume that means that everyone is waiting for their coffee to kick in, or uh, our speakers were just so thorough that everyone's questions have been answered. And it is a quiet group this morning. If you do have any questions for our speakers, feel free to uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself or drop a question into the chat box. And I will ask a question for our, oh, Pierce McGill has his hand up. Pierce, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Um, so uh, it's part statement, part question. Um, We've had trouble getting a straight answer from local CDFIs on kind of what they're doing. Um, are, are, there, are there metrics you need to hit to keep that designation? Do CDFIs have to post the metrics that they are meeting? I, I, I don't have a clear idea locally on, on what our CDFIs are doing and haven't been able to really get a clear answer. So I don't know, maybe you can help guide me on how you put out there what you're doing or how to find out maybe from other sources what CDFIs are doing. And Rebecca, I'll, I'll jump in and make um, a comment on that. So really in order for CDFI to maintain that designation, 60% um, of our lending activity needs to go into the hands of uh, the tar targeted population. Targeted populations can be low income um, areas, uh, areas uh, that have been deemed um, historically populated by African American uh, individuals. Uh, there's a couple designations. One could be a targeted market, uh, which is based upon the US Census uh, establishing the poverty levels of that particular area. 
or um, there could be um, other designations that um, by serving uh, a, a business or another entity that in fact they themselves serve a low income population as well. And so um, we have to um, turn in that uh, information on an annual basis of who we are lending to and how we track that they uh, hit those targeted markets um, or those targeted uh, areas. But the, the hiccup of it all is, is that you, it has to be in your approved targeted market. So, you know, we have a targeted market right now of Roanoke MSA, um, but we're doing a lot of lending in, say, uh, the New River Valley MSA, which may include Radford, which is a persistent poverty area. Uh, Charlottesville is also a consistent poverty area. Uh, we do a little bit of, of lending in that marketplace, um, but they're not in our approved targeted market. So there is a disconnect with the CDFI fund that even though you are still serving that population, if it's not in your approved targeted market is not a win. Um, so there's a little bit of a disconnect there. And we know that the CDFI fund is going under a, a, a new revamp and looking at all of that and uh, trying to look at, at, you know, reconsider all that. But, it, but it's a challenge for us because we're doing all that work, um, but we don't get credit for that work. And it goes against um, our category of meeting that 60% threshold. And what that means to us then is that we cannot pursue financial assistance or technical assistance grants if we don't maintain that designation. Um, so there's a little bit of a disconnect there um, on how that process works. Um, and I, I, I think they're going under um, a revision right now and how we will come out on the, the end of that, who knows. Uh, we're in a six-month blackout period where CDFIs cannot uh, um, pursue that designation or do a targeted market modification. Uh, they and There was a deadline in which all those requests had to be in before they could pursue it. So it is a little bit fuzzy right now uh, on what that is, but, it, uh, but there's a number of different categories that we be considered a, a win or a targeted market, but only if it's approved. So Dave, what what you said brings just a follow-up question. Say that our local CFI has a census tract that's been a, a low-income designated census tract. So they do a loan in that census tract, but not necessarily to a historically underserved population. Does that still count towards their target just because they did a loan in the census tract? It, it would because you could um, lend to uh, say a high net worth individual, but mm -hmm. because he lives in the right census tract, by lending to him, maybe he's bringing job opportunities to serve uh, low income wage earners, or the uh, the loan is going to um, you know be a, to a nonprofit. So it's going to serve credit challenged individuals in some capacity, so that is a win. So it's, um, so a census can be labeled as a targeted market, but certainly have high net worth individuals in there. And if you do lend to them, but because they were in the right targeted market, that is still a win. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's very confusing. <laughs> and Pierce, I'd love to um, maybe offline catch up with you and find out who that CDFI is and and how we can facilitate a strong working relationship. So we have a question in the chat box from Nicole T um, Talton, but also Antonio Miller has his hand raised. So I'm going to kick it to Antonio and then we'll loop back to Nicole's question. Antonio, if you want to unmute yourself, there you go. Thank you. Um, I just had a question for Dave and really uh, any of the other speakers. Could you guys speak to some of the challenges you had for qualifying individuals, particularly those that don't have uh, proper accounting taxes or um, aren't really strong as far as cash flow? How did you guys go about either developing them through technical assistance or what policies did you put in place to kind of, you know, accommodate those particular borrowers? Yeah, so the others may be able to speak a little bit more to this, but be because 
we are a federal regulated entity, we still have to comply to a lot of the rules about being safe and sound, and they have to have, a, let's say, a, you know, um, a, a tax ID number. Um, we also, the credit union has its own foundation as well. Uh, our aspirations is, is for that uh, foundation to be a loan fund as well, so that we could do more lending to different populations without it being subject to our regulatory examinations and auditors. Um, but a lot of them is working with um, the business C type groups that are out there to get them um, up and going. And a lot of times it's the recommend, strong recommendation from them that allows us to paint a different picture that would allow us to stick out our necks a little bit um, because they're not like maybe any other golden borrower that walks to the door, but based upon um, their sweat equity and them really gritting through the process, it gives us the hopes and aspirations that they're going to come through on us. So it is a recommendation from those other groups um, to us to say, yes, they're, they're worth the risk. I can add uh, to that. Um, so at LEDC, we... Like, I think that's one of everyday client for us, <laughs> the people that they don't have the taxes or finance in order. So that's why we have we work like the lending team works really close um, with the small business advice. So for those clients that are not ready, they will be sent to the small business where we they will have a one on one meeting with the coach. And we will start looking into their finance and say, look, um, we will do an like a plan an action plan and based on the action plan we'll say okay we're gonna start like going for your taxes and if it's something that is out of the scope of the coach we also hire external consultants that can for taxes let's say like if we have a a, a client that have like haven't done taxes for like three years so that's something that the coach cannot do so we will hire an external consultant and the consultant will prepare the taxes for them and like but our goal is that we are trying to teach them like how can they better start after the, the the consultant have done the work we want to make sure that they understood and they will have the tool so they can keep doing it right from now on i don't know if that kind of answered your question but i don't know if somebody else wants to jump in no yeah. that, that did answer the question uh, i think both of you touched on what i was asking and it's basically going to be technical assistance and development on our side trying to coach them through it and making sure that they understand the processes even speaking to Dave's point about being uh, federally regulated, we have to answer to the NTUA. And that's why I asked you guys, you know, how did you go about kind of establishing your programs? Because most of the people that come and sit down in front of me, you know, that's kind of the situation. You know, they don't hit the thresholds for borrowing, but we still have to get them qualified, even if it's at a later date. So how, what's the best and most efficient way to go about it? And I think both of you guys touched on that. Thank you. And I think Guf Gufran has his hand raised too. Yes. Uh, just to piggyback on what Dave and uh, Alexandria mentioned. So Antonio, uh, we, uh, CBP, we make our own loan policies. So we have different loan programs. Um, and, we, and and like Dave mentioned that they are local, um, and they have a local underwriters, which is excellent because they understand the market. And we do the same as well. We do understand that there are so many banks offering different programs, but on the same note, we, we know we are aware of the fact that because of COVID and other factors, the cash flow is down. So our debt service coverage ratio is very low compared to other banks um, and traditional banks and credit unions. Our credit uh, um, basically threshold is also low as well. Then again, then we have different programs like STL program where we do not need to see any credit at all. So um, in, in a nutshell, the best thing will be, I would advise you to speak with any of us, talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. We are like your doctors, okay? Mention everything to us, do not hide anything, because what happened is, uh, it's, it's all about the root cause, right? So once we identify the root cause, then what is the causing um, all of that, then we can work on the problem easily. So talk to us. Um, every CDFI, they have tons of programs, right? So it will be confusing that, okay, which program should I apply for? What do I need to do? So the best thing is speak with us, explain us your whole situation, 
once we will understand your situation, then we will guide you in the right direction. But we uh, and other CDFIs, we majority of them, we make our own, own, own policies. Our credit threshold is low. Uh, our uh, um, DSC threshold is low. And we can help you um, basically guide you how to work on uh, profit and loss statement, balance sheet, cash flow projections, and everything. We're not going to do it for you, but we will guide you in the right direction. So you need to work with us one on one in order to um, make you bankable. Thank you. Uh, can I add in just a quick small uh, follow up now? Uh, uh, could any of you kind of give me a ballpark of what? the DSCR and your loan policy is. Right now, we're kind of currently working at like 1.25 based on basically the QSO that we use because we're not even a year into our program. But what is that threshold? What is that minimal threshold for yeah. you guys? For, for CBP, for uh, small businesses, majority of the loan program, the threshold is 0.5 to 1. Right, so industry average is one on one. When we talk about SPA, when we talk about banks, it is one to one point two five. R is point five to one. Does it make sense? Yes, uh, you said point five to one. Correct. Okay, so that we should probably be somewhere similar to that, um, but we're currently at one point two five as well. Yeah, thanks for all of those answers. I'll I'll note for everyone on the call or anyone who hasn't been um, paying attention to the chat that um, Antonio Miller is with People's Advantage Federal Credit Union. And I will also note, um, Antonio, I live on the north side of Virginia, and I think y'all are looking at expanding into a branch in our area. So I think that will be really exciting for the entrepreneurs um, in the Brooklyn Park region of the north side of Richmond. So we're looking forward to seeing you all increase those um, lending opportunities for small businesses here. Let's see. So Nicole, Talton uh, thanked all of our speakers today. Since most of these programs are focused on local targeted areas, not seeing any programs for Hampton Roads other than Virginia Community Capital or LISC, who recently expanded the Small Business Capital Access Fund to include our county in Isle of Wight. Are there any other micro programs for our area? And Dave Prosser did respond that Bridging Virginia may be an option. Um, does anyone have any other options for Nicole to take a look at? Seeing and hearing no one. Uh, oh, Dave, go ahead. Well, I was going to say just, you know, Carlene had posted the uh, CDFI Coalition Group's website. You can go out there and look at all the partners that are in the CDFI group. And there um, probably is certainly another option that's out there if you go to look and see who all the partners are in that group. Thanks, Dave. That's a good idea. I didn't think about that one. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that really is one of the um, best things that has come out of the uh, Virginia Small Business Resiliency Fund, not only the advocacy from the Virginia CDFIs that went into creating that fund, but since that fund has been enacted, that the CDFIs in Virginia have come together now collectively to create the coalition that is uh, really information sharing, knowledge sharing for the Virginia CDFI ecosystem, education, advocacy, and, you know, just really bringing the, uh, the collective units together for biggest impacts in the state. So let's see, Antonio, can we receive the slide with contact information for the presenters? Antonio, we recorded the presentation today. So we are going to make the recording of the presentation along with the slides and the contact information for all of the speakers available to everyone who was registered for the webinar today. And I think that you can also, referring to Carlene's uh, really, a uh, great resource that she gave to everyone. The CDFI Coalition website will really help you in connecting with all of the different entities around the state, but we're definitely gonna get you everyone's contact information. All right, well, we are right at noon. 
So I don't think we could have asked for a, a better time to wrap up, but thank you. We were a small but mighty group this morning, and there was great information from all of our speakers, great questions from our participants. And I hope that everyone is walking away this morning knowing a little bit more about what CDFIs do and how these three CDFIs are helping the small business communities in Virginia. Thank you to our speakers, Carlene, Alexandra, Gufrain, and Dave, and to everyone who was on the call today. And again, stay tuned. We will be posting the recording and getting the slides out to everyone. Thanks and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Rebecca. Take care, everyone.